Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Kayla Cunningham. I'm an endocrinologist and one of the leads of the Verda Employee Group Burtons for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I'm excited to be kicking off our first session of the conference focusing on health equity. Disparities in health outcomes uh, among patients reveal deep systemic inequities across race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. And while health equity has been an important topic of conversation, the hard work to actually reduce those inequities requires resources, bold risk-taking, and constant iteration. How are leading health plans and employers working to address disparities to make more equitable healthcare outcomes a reality? Health equity needs to be a critically important cornerstone of Verda's commitment to a more equitable and inclusive future. Before we dive into the larger panel, and as we wait for more guests to join, I'll be sharing a short 10-minute presentation on health equity and what we found so far in our population at Verda. Next slide, please. We are very familiar with the problem of diabetes in the United States. About one in 10 people live with type two diabetes and the prevalence is growing. It is also true that the prevalence of diabetes varies between racial and ethnic groups. Diabetes disproportionately affects black, brown and indigenous people of color. Diabetes is seen at higher rates among these people um, and identifying as Asian, black, Hispanic or indigenous heritage compared to non-Hispanic white people. These groups then also bear a disproportionate burden of the complications arising from uncontrolled diabetes like kidney failure, eye disease, stroke, nerve damage, heart disease, and premature death. Next slide, please. Disparities in health outcomes are very closely linked to so social determinants of health. These are scientifically validated measures of social, economic, and environmental disadvantage. Researchers have found that social determinants of health, the social and environmental conditions in which people grow up, they live, work, play, and age, that these significantly influence the chance that a person may develop type 2 diabetes and the degree to which they will experience complications of the disease. Social determinants of health include things like what you see here on the list on the right. And I'd like to highlight two components in particular that impact our patients daily food insecurity and affordability of prescriptions. Food insecurity is a lack of consistent access to quality, variety, or desirable food. More people with diabetes are food insecure than those without diabetes, making it difficult for them to access healthy food options that can improve blood sugars. Additionally, people with diabetes often report taking less medication than prescribed or delaying refills due to the cost which can further contribute to uncontrolled diabetes and poor outcomes. I've had patients in my practice with diabetes whose lives depend on insulin to survive, whose lives also revolve around monthly revolving door visits to the emergency room and diabetic coma because they can't afford the insulin required to survive. Next slide, please. So one score called the Area Deprivation Index is another scientifically validated measure it incorporates income along with a few of the key components of the social determinants of health. And then it combines those features with location at the level of a census block group, your neighborhood zip code level. The ADI has been used by researchers for a few decades now and reflects a geographic area's level of disadvantage. The ADI includes factors such as housing, education, employment status. It goes beyond income and some of these social determinants of health to include the geography. And this is important because geography and zip code can reflect structural inequities caused by things like previously legal policies like redlining, where banks would refuse even qualified people for mortgages. Your zip code also reflects policy decisions that put manufacturing or a highway through neighborhoods to create a disadvantaged east side community. These are institutional and structural policies that Stephen DeBerry has described as disparity by design. Because it's at the zip code level, the, the ADI can reflect access to grocery stores, safe housing, and clean water. These geographic areas are then ranked and grouped by percentile, decile, or quintile. And in many analyses, or, and also in ours, we'll talk about today, we group them into quintiles, so five groups spanning from one, which is the least disadvantaged in the nation, the blue range on the left, 
three is the middle ground, and then five on the right is in red, representing the most disadvantaged areas in the country. Next slide, please. So Verda enrolls patients nationwide. So this is a snapshot of the ADI for where our patients live. Along the bottom of the graph are the ADI quintiles where one on the far left in blue is the least disadvantaged and five on the far right in red is the most disadvantaged. And about 27% of our patients live in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods in the country. We do skew a little bit towards the more advantaged areas. 91% um, of our current patients are enrolled via their employer. So you're gonna to skew towards a more employed and advantaged population. Next slide, please. Another place we often see health disparities is across racial and ethnic groups. Verda attracts a diverse group of patients with type two diabetes who choose to enroll in our reversal treatment. And about a third report identifying as a racial or ethnic group. Next slide, please. The green bars here are an estimate of the percentage of commercially insured people with type two diabetes by race or ethnicity. Verda's enrollment breakdown is in the blue bars and closely matches a commercially insured population. The gray bars represent the distribution of diabetes across the US population. And what we can gather from this graph is that there's an opportunity for all of us um, for, to enroll more Asian, Black, and Hispanic people as we grow and expand access to Verda. Next slide, please. And how are patients doing? Uh, pleased to say that many people um, that they're doing great. Many people think that Verda is a treatment only for those who are more advantaged. They think following a nutrition therapy or a lifestyle intervention is only for the most affluent who can afford it or make time for it. As an endocrinologist, I know I've spoken with patients who were never offered the chance to even know how the foods or beverages they consume are impacting their sugars. They were referred to me to start insulin, but were never told that if you were willing to maybe drop the new sweet tea habit that they picked up over the summer, they may not need to add medications. Um, it's what Dr. Gray's referred to in terms of time. We often don't have the time to go through these things. That intervention doesn't require a trip to a Whole Foods. That's an accessible change if somebody has the time to explain it. Um, our data shows that regardless um, of neighborhood level of disadvantage, Verda still helps people significantly improve their type 2 diabetes as measured by their A1C. These average reductions of 1.2 to 1.3% are both statistically and clinically significant. They're clinically significant because every 1% decrease in A1C is associated with reduced diabetes complications, heart attacks, kidney failure, blindness. Not only are the A1C significantly approved across all groups, the groups have an average A1C at six months that actually falls below the American Diabetes Association goal of 7% for treatment. Some groups even fall below 6.5%, the threshold for diagnosing diabetes. We can see, though, that while all groups have clinically significant and meaningful improvements, the more disadvantaged groups in the red and the orange seem to have less improvement. This data, however, is... Uh, this is the data we have so far and data collection and analysis is still ongoing as we continue to take a close look at this. These A1C improvements also came with reduced need for medications across all disadvantaged area groups. Across ADI quintiles one through five, 58 to 53 percent of diabetes medicines other than metformin were de-prescribed by six months. So reducing the need for medication and out-of-pocket costs for our patients is a real-world impact we can provide for all of our patients who might have economic barriers to affording their medications. Next slide, please. Speaking about how health equity can be exciting for some, um, let's continue to talk about um, the results in terms of race and ethnicity. When it, um, when it comes to outcomes, we also see that across all racial and ethnic backgrounds, not only are A1C significantly improved, all groups have an average A1C at six months that's below the 88, again, below the 88 target of 7%. And again, some groups, um, as you can see, are less likely to fall below the 6.5% group. And, um, but everybody, is able to achieve a 1% decrease in A1C that's associated with reduced complications. And all of that is 
meaningful. Again, this is in the setting of deprescription of medications, um, ranging from 52% of non, non metformin diabetes medications in, black, in our black patients to 59% in our patients who identify as Asian. Next slide, please. All right, so speaking about health equity can be exciting for some and unsettling for others. So some people might look at Verda's great outcomes while deprescribing medications and ask, why do we even need to talk about the gaps? This is good news. And nervous discomfort can feel like a threat. You know, check in with how you're feeling when you see these kinds of results. Um, when we see, when we feel uncomfortable, sometimes it's like feeling like a threat. And when we're threatened, we can react from our survival reflexes. And that's fight, flight, or freeze. So fight would be something like, that's not me. I'm not the bad guy here. Uh, flight, let's not even talk about these gaps anymore. Freeze, all of this is overwhelming and too big. I don't even know where to start. And I would like to offer a fourth F for fuel. We can notice that discomfort and turns toward it and use, use it as rocket fuel to break through the atmosphere of the known world and into a world where we envision that we can, that we envision that we can achieve health, health, equitable health outcomes. We can apply rigor and innovation to claim the health equity advantage, right? To fire up growth in a way that is a win-win for everyone. There are many quotes that point to this. If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. So if you're uncomfortable talking about it, it's probably a good sign. And so Verda aims to have the following commitments to health equity-based solutions. Commitments to evidence-backed outcomes-oriented solutions that will help uncover gaps and identify solutions to close them. We aim to continue contributing to the literature. Research studies now aim to include diverse populations, which is great, but it's exceedingly rare to find published results of these outcomes across different demographic groups. I suspect that it's because the results are uncomfortable and that the data is subject to publication bias. But Verda's stepping out here to lead and share what we have. And we invite other industry leaders to do the same, to start contributing to the conversation by sharing results that actually break down these outcomes by these demographics. Verda continues to aim to learn new strategies, to expand access to innovation in diabetes care, um, innovations in diabetes care are happening. So let's focus on getting these innovations to more people safely and affordably. We aim to partner with experts to provide culturally responsive care, not only hiring a diverse care team, but also building empathy as allies to better understand how our patients' backgrounds impacts their health decision-making. Industry leaders need to also design and plan our roadmap with health equity at top of mind. If some of these disparities were created intentionally and structurally, closing the gaps also requires intentional planning and accountability. Equal outcomes start at the inception of new healthcare systems. As we introduce new solutions, everyone wins when health equity is a central part of the inception rather than a philanthropic afterthought. And of course, we listen, we aim to listen and engage. There's no substitute for understanding lived experience and partnering with community leaders to ensure that health equity is at the core of everything we do. And those most impacted need to be represented at the planning table. Last slide, please. This is a cartoon first published in 2012 to try to convey the concept of equity and equality. Equal access and opportunity is great, but it is not sufficient to achieve equity. Providing an innovative and amazing service is part of the equation and some patients, but some patients are going to need additional supports to achieve the same outcomes. In my mind, these boxes represent toolkits. How we get to equitable, equitable outcomes will take intention, accountability, willingness to be uncomfortable, the humility of a beginner's mind and all of our creativity and collaboration in order to optimize, optimize available resources and to use our tools in new, new ways. So this is bigger than any one organization and it requires an ongoing conversation of adjustment and iteration to keep improving. With that, I'm excited to introduce our special guest for the panel, Joanna Baylog Reynolds, is the VP of Clinical Consulting and National, National Wellbeing Solutions Leader at Siegel. 
Joanna is a doctoral trained registered nurse and also a nationally recognized expert in clinical program design. Dr. Daryl Gray is Chief Health Equity Officer at Elevance Health. Dr. Gray is a health equity advocate, clinical and policy expert, and the inaugural Chief of Health Equity, uh, inaugural Chief Health Equity Officer for Elevance. Benjamin Jackson is the uh, VP of HR Technology and Analytics at at and He's a telecommunications expert and has led benefits initiatives at at and for over 10 years, launching several campaigns and programs that were recognized nationally by the White House. Dr. Nora Dennis is the lead medical director for Blue Cross North Carolina. Dr. Dennis drives behavioral health and health equity strategy at Blue Cross North Carolina and as a board certified psychiatrist and addiction medicine specialist. Biggest welcome to our special guests. Over to you, Joanna, to kick off the panel. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to say thank you to Verda for hosting this panel, a robust panel, a very important topic right now. And you know, this conversation has been evolving a bit in benefits over the past few years, but as a healthcare professional, this is something I've been dealing with in my practice since I started. I'm a nurse, I'm a case manager, and literally my job was to take the treatment plan that the physicians wrote and try to help our patients you know, work through that treatment plan when, within their own ecosystem. I mean, I can actually remember getting a steno notebook and drawing out a chart for diabetic patients so they could write everything down for their doctor to see next month that they came in. Think about how, you know, arbitrary that was or how difficult that was. And, and then handing a worksheet of an 1,800 ADA calorie diet to a patient that, you know, didn't speak English as their first language. So, I mean, we have certainly evolved in how we're addressing some of these inequities, but we still have a ways to go. And so from a benefit standpoint, a plan sponsor standpoint, you know, whose responsibility is it to address some of these social inequities and really what can you do to kind of help move that forward? So without further ado, I want to jump into the first questions with our panelists. Um, I did learn that everyone likes banana and peanut butter for breakfast, so that was something at least half our panelists had this morning. But beyond that, um, I'd like to start with Dr. Gray to say, you know, if you're new to this topic, what resources, podcasts, you know, magazines, what have you, would you kind of point people in a direction to start to look at? You know, um, it, it depends on people's preferred platform. You know, I'll tell you, with, with all of the, I guess, negative things that happen with social media, it can also be a, a fantastic way to connect with community, to connect with people of like mind, or even preferably, actually, people who may not think like you, uh, to learn about what's going on in health. I think LinkedIn provides a great professional platform for sharing of articles. Um, you know, uh, I, I know Nora and, and I both kind of share information. I shared an article this morning around maternal health. Um, but I think that as people think about outside of that, I ask people to stretch to kind of some of the social literature as well. Um, so one great book that I really love is one published by Daniel Dawes uh, called The Political Determinants of Health. And people, you know, we've talked, and I saw some of the earlier sessions that really kind of iron out what the social drivers, the social determinants of health, but to think even further upstream about those political determinants that influence health outcomes and adversely impact what we are trying to do in advancing health equity is critically important. Um, so, so I would say there are wonderful books like, like that out, like, like what Dr. Daniel Dawes has published there is are great resources on social media, LinkedIn being an example, where you can join a community just by entering a hashtag in the search field of LinkedIn, such as health equity, to see those who are kind of putting out content, publishing in this area. Um, but also to your point, there's podcasts. Um, and there is such a slew of podcasts, depending on where our viewers today are tuning in from. I'll tell you, there's even in the children's podcasts or children's mm -hmm. facing podcasts, such as Reach Out and Read. Um, they have some interesting content in regards to health equity as well. So the good news is that there is not a dearth of, of opportunities to engage with community around learning about, you know, what are some of the problems within trying to advance health equity, but also more so, and importantly, what are the solutions that we should be working toward? Thank you. Um, so Benjamin, I actually saw some healthcare popping up in GQ recently. Do you have any other recommendations outside of that of what you would uh, tell people to read? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that is not a publication. I, uh, <laughs> my, my wife would definitely tell you I don't read that magazine very often. Um, so, and, and actually not to, um, I, I don't want to bring this down, but um, an important book for me, um, because my understanding of the history of some of uh, how we've approached um, healthcare t and testing healthcare, uh, I didn't know anything about that. It was particularly germane to us during COVID, but um, the book Medical Apartheid, um, I think is a really critical uh, read to understand, uh, especially how uh, African Americans have been treated by the healthcare system. Um, and you know, we we were doing big pushes for you know vaccination efforts uh, around COVID and and you know safe return to work. Um, we were doing all kinds of measurement and you know started to ask questions like why are why are different kind of populations of people not engaging in the same way. And um, I had some really influential people that were kind of helping me through this time. And they pointed me to some of these resources to say, hey, it's probably important that you understand the history um, and, and not like 20 years of history, like 200 years of history um, mm -hmm. and understand the relationship between some of these underserved populations and, and the medical establishment. So that how you position, position uh, messaging, how you talk to employees, how you talk to different groups uh, maybe outside of your company, like you know where they're coming from, and so that's a that's a real heavy read. Um, but I think it's really important for all of us to kind of understand the history uh, so that we can uh, better shape the future. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I had one credit in my entire bachelor's degree on cultural competency, so I was meant to understand everything to, when I got to the bedside off of one credit, and that was pretty much a book report that I had to write, read, and write. Uh, Dr. Dennis, anything that you can talk about from your training or experience? Yeah, I, I really think that IHI's website has some pretty amazing resources, um, particularly kind of taking things from an organizational perspective as well. If one is sort of thinking like, how do I start on this journey for my organization? Um, what are the ways that I can really like understand and, and sort of structure my my efforts. I, I really appreciate the resources that they have to share. And then um, I have a friend who wrote a book called Black Man in a White Coat and sometimes um, also writes uh, columns for New York Times and other um, other publications. His name is Dr. Damon Tweedy. And I, I really felt like Black Man in a White Coat um, in a lot of ways kind of gave a perspective on equity that was coming through Damon's lived experience during his medical training um, that was really engaging and really powerful. And knowing that this is not a long time ago, right? Um, it, it's no. within the past 20 years. And um, and I think that, that medical trainees, particularly trainees of color, do get, unfortunately, front row seats to a lot of the inequities that happen that are really interpersonal um, bias driven versus structurally driven. And those are really important that we keep in mind as well. Yeah, and to your and point, Joanna, I mean, this is, oh, go ahead, yeah. I was, I was gonna say, I just wanted to double click um, on both what Benjamin said, but also what Nora said, the suggestions. I mean, honestly, as you think about, you gave your experience about being in school and having kind of one credit. I mean, the resources that they mentioned, I, I think should be required readings. Um, I had the pleasure, like both of them, to, to read those books and to meet Dr. Tweedy. Um, and I, I think it's, just like Benjamin said, I think it's like fundamental history, mm -hmm. um, but also putting in context kind of what some of the people that we serve actually are experiencing even though medical apartheid kind of chronicles a history, you know, people are experiencing such things today as is outlined in, in kind of Damon Tweedy's book. Um, I would also put a shameless plug um, for our website. So if people were to go, for example, to elevanshealth.com and they click on um, the tab that says our approach to health, they can scroll down to where it says health equity and there are a wealth of articles. Um, on different topics such as cultural humility, such as you know health equity, what it means, how it's different from equality, just to get a kind of basic foundational knowledge as well. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And just to kind of cap this off too, from a training standpoint, um, Dr. Dennis, your point of we're not talking that far in the past, it, it really is still happening, but even just our training manuals, I mean, everything was on white skin and every single you know, simulation that I went through in nursing school was on a white body. And so how do I, you know, as a nurse walk into a patient's room and look for an IV? 
just even very something very simple and fundamental to nursing. And so I had to learn that as I went in my practice and continue to evolve. Um, so shifting a little bit to think about the role that data plays and we're getting better at collecting demographic data and understanding more about the population, but you know, what role does data play in the analysis that you've done so far in your populations? And um, do you think we have enough data to really get to the underlying issues? Uh, so let's start with Benj Benjamin. Yeah, I, I think if we wait for perfect data sets, uh, we're probably never gonna start. Um, these things have to be iterative uh, and you have to build data models that mature over time. And so uh, I'll obviously speak for employers uh, so we, we are doing everything to work across our ecosystem with our partners to get as much, you know, clinical uh, data as possible. Um, at the same time, I think it's equally important that we're looking for external data sets that kind of supplement uh, and complement what we're able to get from, you know, just claims in our data warehouse. And so we've started in the last um, really six months or so starting to look at census data. Um, so these uh, data sets are starting to come online from the 2020 census. And so there's a lot we can learn with like zip code data um, and the diversity metrics that are available from census um, that, are, um, that are just really helpful to, um, to use when you're also looking at internal data as well. And then we just need to keep iterating these things over time and being in forums like this to share our best practices. Thank you. Um, it's so true that we keep seeing new data sets coming up and then ingesting that and seeing what it shows us. Uh, so Dr. Dennis, you talked on your keynote about your moonshot and everything else. Do you, how is data kind of informing you getting to those goals? So with respect to um, our goals internally at Blue Cross Blue Shield, I think that, uh, well, Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina, I'll speak for everybody in the, in the country, but, um, but you know, data is like really one of our goals in and of itself that having that gold standard self-reported data but i would also definitely echo benjamin that we really have to move forward with the data that we have and i think it, as a payer it gives us a really great opportunity to also partner with health systems partner with um, providers for data exchange so that we can we can share if they have um, observed data or self-reported data from patients who, for whom we are the payer, then can we have data exchange so that we're able to complement our data set because we really think of there being a hierarchy of um, data in terms of the quality where the, you know, the best case scenario, of course, would be that we had self-reported data, but observed is second to that. And for a lot of folks that may well be accurate. And then of course the imputed data, meaning I take all of the things that I do know about you and then try to use use all of that data inferentially to, to determine your race is sort of the, the lowest level of data. And so I think it's really important that we um, take advantage of our relationships and collaborations to try to drive forward the best quality of data that we can in any given moment. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, data, we have a ton of healthcare data. We have it in our watches, we have it in our point solutions and our carriers, and then at the provider level, and it's so fragmented. I mean, there's an informatics a track for nurses and physicians just for that reason. So um, Dr. Gray, I mean, being at Elevance, yeah. you guys have a pretty big data set, right? So can you talk a little bit about what you're doing? Yeah, you know, at the, at the core of what we're doing, we, we honestly, we want to advance health beyond healthcare. And ultimately be that trusted partner in health. And as we kind of to complement what both Benjamin and Nora said, I think to be that trusted partner, we have to do a couple of things. One, we have to know our members better than we do today. Um, and two, we have to really share and be transparent why we're collecting the data and how we plan to use it. Um, that's part of that trust building. Um, and I think, you know, while there are certain domains that, that we historically have done a, a good job at collecting, self, meaning direct attested or, or self-reported member data, there are many areas where we haven't. And to Nora's point, that is the gold standard. What, how someone wants to identify themselves is the gold standard. And we, as an industry, are moving away, albeit we still need to leverage imputed data, but are moving away from that, understanding that, you know, we need to connect with our members first um, and use how they want to identify and interact with our staff as a partnership to advance their health. And so, 
as I think about what we're doing, number one, we are, um, again, dialing in on that, trying to be a better partner with our members to collect more self-reported data, shifting away from, as we think about how we collect race, ethnicity, language, mm -hmm. sexual orientation, gender identity, shift away from uh, imputed, imputed data as much as possible to that self-attested. Um, and then I think, you know, the important thing is not just collecting that information, but how we're using it. So how, using that information to inform our programming, to inform our education, not only of our members, but certainly the providers with whom we're partnering with as well. Um, because providers are a critical piece of us advancing health equity. And to that point, you know, it informs our expectations for providers, whether you know, it's, it's us building a value-based program where we are requesting them to share data with us in regards to members, or how we report to them and expect reporting back in regards to outcomes as it pertains to specific stratified demographic variables. Um, so this is all part of, of, of um, kind of assessment action, but I'll, I'll add a third A, um, which is kind of accountability. Um, there has to be accountability around the data that goes back to that transparency piece, that goes back to, frankly, the, the action piece as well, and how we are collecting and using and making transparent this data. And it's it's an evolving process. And I think that is for, for many of us in this industry, it is it is very much evolving. So let's pull at that thread a little bit further. If we think yeah. about trust and you know, our data has been sold all over the world now at this point, but healthcare historically was protected by HIPAA. But now as we, what you just said is asking individuals to self-identify versus taking, you know, what we kind of have in the demographic. I've seen in my practice and some and some areas even internally at different companies that some employees no longer even want to self-identify because they don't want that of record or to be sold. So can you expand a little bit more on instilling trust in individuals as we ask them for more of this type of personal information and track more of this? Yeah, this this also goes back to something that um, Norman Benjamin said. You know, it's it, it takes partnerships because we, as Elevance Health, just like any other pair, you know, we can't just rely on ourselves to build that kind of trust with the, with the health ecosystem and data. Um, but it takes partnership with the employers, and that's one of the things that, for example, we've done. We recently uh, partnered with kind of Deloitte, the Urban Institute, and um, the American Benefits Council in working with employers to better understand what are the barriers they see as employers serving you know, millions of, of folks in, in the workforce to collecting that information, whether it be trust or, or otherwise, um, but then also what are the solutions uh, that we can take towards that? So I think that's one example of how we need to continue to partner to build that trust to your point, Joanna, is partnerships with employers partnerships with uh, non-traditional, if you will, um, um, uh, stakeholders that, that our members leverage, use, and work with. Yeah, so Benjamin, let's go to you next because you are the employer. So um, are you seeing that any issues with trust in your population? How are you handling that? Well, I, I wanted to, not to be, uh, you know, throw water on this thing, but so and, and highlight something that I think we're going to see more of. So um, California passed uh, Consumer Data Protection Act um, earlier this year. And then there was the outstanding question of, does that apply to employee data? Um, and that was the, the actual legislation was silent on it. And they went through uh, kind of a re revised opinion period. And they, they just came out in uh, September and said, oh, actually, yeah, this, this applies to employee data as well. And, that, and those laws go into effect in California January 1st. And so uh, an, um, an employee of AT&T in California can call us on January 1st and say, I want to know where all of my uh, employee data is, including HR data. I want to see a full inventory of it. And I want to, and then for what is, uh, and I'm not an attorney here and, and didn't work on you know, interpreting it, but basically for like non-core data um, that's required to basically have me be an employee, I can request for that to be deleted. Um, and so we just talked about the value of complementary data sets, partnering across the ecosystem to build these. Um, and then I think that you're going to see more and more of these legal protections pop up in certain states that I think is going to put a real wrench into this. And so I, I'm usually not the person that says, hey, we need to really think about our governance models. Uh, we really need to think about the guardrails for how we secure this data. But we've got to do that 
across these ecosystems. And then when we talk to employees or members about the data we use, we have to, we have to one, say what we're going to do with it and do it, right? Be transparent and, and kind of be authentic in how we're using the data and then show the value of us having access to it. Um, and if that's, you know, quality outcomes or, or whatever it is on, on the, with the medical plan, uh, the benefits of at t as an employer having your data, like we've got to tell a story and then follow through on why they should allow us to have it. Because I, I think this is, this is kind of like GDPR light. Um, and I think this is going to be a new theme that we've all got to be prepared to, to handle and like understand how you're going to solve some of these things in your data models. It's a really great perspective. And I, I feel bad for you guys on January 1 answering all those phone calls. Um, but let's stick with you, Benjamin, and talk a little bit about, uh, we uh, in the introduction, we talked a lot about food insecurity and with diabetes in particular, you know, we know that cardiovascular risk goes up very, very quickly. Um, so in my intro, I did kind of say, you know, whose responsibility or what role do you play in addressing these social inequities? And we're really talking about non-traditional benefit designs or non-traditional approach to healthcare, but to help reduce your healthcare costs. So where do you feel the employer comes in and are you doing anything creative right now already? Yeah, I, I think this one's really tricky, uh, candidly. So um, I, I'll probably talk about our perspective as an employer, but then maybe maybe talk about how we help more broadly and, and kind of what the AT&T position is uh, for how we can help in communities. And so, you know, we're, we're always looking at things like um, incentives, wellness credits, and kind of how we're designing those um, to give a range of flexibility for our members, you know, uh, especially people who may be in like food deserts or, or don't have great access uh, to programs. So, you know, I think we, we've done some evolution in, Kind of how we earmark those dollars and and create more flexibility with how they're spent um, and we've even got some changes for next year that we're excited about so we're going to keep doing that and then when when someone's physically on a campus in one of our buildings there's a lot we can do there with healthy food options we work really closely with our our, um, our cafeteria partners aramark to make sure that we're you know kind of properly subsidizing the healthy food compared to you know the hamburger or whatever and so there's there's some little tactical things we can do there and we're, we've been doing for a decade plus um, where when the employee leaves work it, it, it uh, especially on the food issue it gets a little it, it's less clear for us and frankly we haven't done as much there um, but then kind of more broadly you know our point of view for, for kind of all of these health equity piece uh, considerations is like technology creates a lot of opportunity and so for us that's creating connectivity for people in underserved uh, communities. And so there's about 30% of Americans that don't have kind of regular and consistent access to the internet. And when we give, we know that when people have access to the internet, their education levels, their access to resources, um, access to, to get medical care now, especially in more with more virtual services, that goes up. And so we've made a, a $2 billion uh, commitment to closing the digital divide. Um, and so, you know, it's, you're not going to see an AT&T grocery store uh, in a in a food desert, uh, a healthy food desert in South Chicago, like that's weird. But we want to light that place up with fiber and and affordable uh, internet connectivity, so that the people in those communities can tap into technologies that create access and capacity. So, like from a more macro perspective, that's a way that we can authentically help um, contribute to the broader health equity situation that we have in the U.S. And we're going to continue to do more of that in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we've seen studies come out about incentive design. That's a really critical thing to be thoughtful about because we've seen where, you know, putting incentives in place actually can penalize hourly workers that don't have time to take off to go get their screenings. And so then you're actually kind of reversing engineering what you want to do to begin with. Um, and then just the internet access, we have all these point solutions. And But if you put them in place and people don't have access to a smartphone or the internet, you know, it's really not useful. Um, so what you're talking about is very critical across the entire population, not just your own. Um, so uh, Dr. Dennis, can you share anything? You know, you talked a little bit too about value-based care design. And, you know, I, I start to think evolving as food as medicine and practicing a little bit differently. So what creative solutions have you been working on? Absolutely. So I, I feel really proud of our plan um, because we, we have a specific drivers of health team that really takes almost a quasi-experimental approach 
to some of these problems and food is one of those. So really researching like not only we know that um, that giving folks healthy food is helpful to them in terms of their um, you know their glycemic control is helpful to them in terms of health outcomes, um, but also establishing the helpfulness in terms of total cost of care. And I think that's really important. Sometimes I think people hear that and they're like, oh, you know, health plans so greedy, blah blah blah. I always think about it from the perspective also of our members. Like we have everybody shares cost, right? Like they like people have to pay for the care they receive in addition to the health plan being part of it. And so whenever we give folks access to something that decreases the cost of care for them, um, for us, it also decreases it for them, which is really important. And so, so that team has been really successful in working with some of our um, academic partners locally in North Carolina, University of North Carolina, chief among them, to really get a better understanding of the best way to deliver um, food as medicine or prescription food um, uh, to our members who who qualify and who need that um, that benefit. And so so I feel extremely proud of that. You know, North Carolina is the 10th hungriest state in the nation, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so it's something that we really need. And, you know, I, I personally also find it just amazing how quickly we just as Americans no longer are able to grow food for ourselves as well. You know, like if I even just look one generation ago at my mother's generation, everybody, she grew up very poor, she's black, she's in the South, and they also grew food and in some ways had a healthier diet and more access to food with, despite having fewer resources than um, what people have now, and I and I always find that find that amazing, and sort of have a hope for us also to for for folks to take back the power to to um, generate food for themselves as well. Absolutely, I mean that's just more sustainable, right? Um, I mean, if you've ever eaten food in the hospital, it's kind of embarrassing what we're feeding people that are trying to heal. And so the point you made about partnering with the local providers and the university is really important to kind of move this forward. So um, Dr. Gray, anything that you are working on creative solutions right now at Elevance? Yeah, what's, it's, it's really an exciting time because uh, to the earlier point, I think, you know, a, as a health plan, we are traditionally seen as just an insurer uh, just uh, the, the kind of party or the entity that's helping to achieve optimal physical health. But one of the things that I am really excited about is that we have kind of broadened the aperture on that and really said, no, it's not just about physical health, it's about whole health. So addressing people's social needs, behavioral needs, and, and we're in a unique position to also address kind of the pharmacy needs that, that also help to optimize someone's health. Particularly as it pertains to the social piece, you know, food as medicine is a, is one key focus area for us, not just in kind of what we're doing. And, and I'll reference some of the amazing work of my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Pam Lyons Taylor, who is our chief social impact officer, who's created a community connected care program to kind of move both from the well, move from the idea of, of uh, collecting more information from our members to identify social needs. But based on that information, tailoring to that personal member uh, the touch points that they need to kind of close the gaps on whatever unmet social needs they have, but also to ensure that they are, are uh, leveraging benefit design to optimize that, that they are being connected to community partners in the way that's meaningful, but also that the information is getting back to providers. So that's something that's really exciting. I also speak to one of my colleagues and friends, uh, Lance Christman, who leads our foundation. You know, we have made tremendous investment in really three areas across health equity. Food is medicine, maternal health, and substance use disorder. We've committed to date, and this is just since 2020, over $20 million to food is medicine. Um, because we believe, to your point, that um, food is a critical component and food security is a critical component to someone's health. So, you know, it's so much exciting work that we're doing to address this, and it's only going to get better and continue to evolve as we move forward. And what we learn, particularly as we are partnering with our foundation with community-based organizations, with academic institutions, is kind of, I think, what you referenced earlier, um, Benjamin, when you were talking about, I think you mentioned co-design um, as a term, and, and particularly we feel that uh, those community-based partners, those people who are closest to those facing inequities are those with the best solutions. And so the more that we partner with those people in communities, the better off we will be, but certainly more importantly, the better off our communities will be. Um, and so that's, that's incredibly exciting for us. 
Thank you. Um, so this is open to the whole panel because this is going to be a little bit of a daring question, uh, but there is beauty in failure. So what have you tried that hasn't worked and what lessons have you learned that you can share with the audience, especially as they're just getting started, some people on this journey? Oh, I'm I'm not shy of failure. Uh, so I'll, <laughs> I was going to say, who wants to be brave? <laughs> I'll go first. So uh, yeah, this was, this was in 2019 before the pandemic. Um, I, I mentioned uh, I mentioned the south side of Chicago. So we we have a call center there. It is a PCP desert, um, and we partnered with Blue Cross, um, great partner of ours, and we we knew that um, transportation and like physically being able to get to the doctor was it was a large barrier uh, for for people in that call center. And so we worked on this rideshare program where you know blue cross was um was giving like lift vouchers uh so that people could go get you know care uh, primary care visits and and we were like man this is such a great idea like you know we're, we're like getting embedded in this community and like really making a difference um the problem is you know the the closest facility in chicago traffic in the afternoon um even though it was you know five miles away um at rush hour that that turned out to be like you know a two-hour drive uh, plus the the visit time, plus the return trip, and next thing you know, you know this person that's that's in a, a front line, you know, a union position, a call center has taken six hours of their day uh, to get a doctor appointment, um, and that actually, um, you know, we kind of didn't think through some of those logistics, right? Of of like long cycle times, right. it's like people were having to take time off PTO, right, to go to go to the doctor and um, or, or, you know, putting stress on wages and things like that. They may, maybe didn't work that afternoon to go. And it's like, did we further set the person back? So we, yeah, they got their doctor's appointment. That's great. We should celebrate that. But like, how did we inconvenience their broader, their broader life? Like the amount of time, um, the impact on their wages, the impact on their family, um, you know, if they, if they have to take care of children. And, and so it's like, it, we we thought like okay we were solving one specific problem but we actually maybe created two or three or or, or more uh, with the ripple effects of the solution and so you know for for one it, it kind of made us recommit and double down on the idea of like these digital health experiences are just like critical right and so if if we can get this connectivity part right um, and we we can do our core service well which is which is connecting people and being a telecom um, and technology provider like we can do that and then leverage the ecosystem and, and and try to push more of these digital solutions because that, that person's a great candidate for, you know, a, a virtual PCP visit versus having to spend six hours. So, you know, I, I think you got to go through some of these failures to under, to really peel back the layers of the onion to understand all the ways that you're affecting people. Um, and that, that will make our next solution more thoughtful and, and and some percentage better, maybe not a hundred percent, right? We're not going to get all the way there. We got to keep iterating at these things, um, but not be afraid of failure because these are these are really large, complex problems, unique in communities all across the country, and they they will have their own solutions. Like we can't be afraid to fail and learn and iterate and then keep going. And so we learned a lot from that, right? And we strengthened a partnership, and like those people did feel supported but we just had some ways we could make it better. So we're just gonna keep going. Now, as an employer, and I'll let the other panelists talk about failures too, but specifically as an employer, are you talking with other fellow employers kind of in your same size and group to brainstorm around this or share some of these learnings? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a part of why we um, show up to great events like this, right? And and want to um, want to tell our story and and hear what other people are doing. And they're, um, you know, Josh. I saw Josh on here before, right? We're we're a member of EHIR. We get plugged into these communities, business group on health. We try to learn what other what others are doing there. You know, frankly, I think COVID has set this back in a lot of ways. Um, we used to attend a lot of conferences. We used to be outside of our walls and we would we would have these natural physical connectivity points to share what we were doing and learn from each other i think a lot of that has been really wiped out in the last two and a half years so um you know we we haven't done as much sharing we haven't done as much uh, learning as we want to be doing and so you know part of um getting that jump started again is is being in these forums 
um, and, and getting back out there and, and kind of the conference and other settings so that we can just share and learn together because the, these things are so massive. No, nobody's going to solve it on their own. Right. So we, we've got to be sharing right. and bubbling up the best ideas. Yeah, they really are about partnerships to move this forward at every level. So um, to the either other panelists, do you want to share any sort of learnings or, you know, kind of stuff that didn't yeah, work out so well? For sure. Um, so our team earlier this year published in New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst about our large ACO program in North Carolina um, and looking at the ways that we were or weren't driving equity through that program just on the basis of who was actually included. So if we looked at inclusion by area deprivation index, we basically found that um, the members who were in the um, areas that had a higher ADI score, meaning that they had more challenges in terms of social drivers of health were less likely to be included um, in this large program that we knew drives savings and drives quality, and that over time that that actually got worse rather than getting better. And it had not been an intentional focus of the program to drive equity. The, you know, we talked about driving savings, we talked about driving quality, but we didn't talk about driving equity. And I think it was a really important object lesson that we cannot neglect to include equity at the most fundamental level of almost every program that we create as a health plan. So sometimes I think we think, okay, we're going to do this for equity. We're going to do this for equity, but it's actually almost the flip where everything we do, how are we assuring that it's driving equity and especially the things that are um, related to payment and financial arrangements, because we can actually inadvertently create disincentive for including vulnerable communities, that is a very powerful disincentive for, for health systems. And we really have to actually do the opposite. And so, um, you know, we, as we're kind of thinking about next iterations, equity is at the at the center of how we're thinking about that, about that work. Um, and I feel so proud of our plan that that's the case. And I also feel proud that folks were okay with us publishing and saying, hey, we did this thing. And like, it yeah. actually had the opposite of the effect that we intended and, and that we're going to do better because, um, there can be just so much performative allyship and um, it's it's not fooling anybody who's actually in the communities that are impacted, to be honest. Um, so why not be honest about what's actually happening and about what we're going to do to change? Yeah, and to your point, you know, and theoretically, you come up with this really, really great idea, but then somewhere in implementation, you have some of these gaps that to your point, cause further inequities. Um, so Dr. Gray, anything to share? Yeah, I'll just say, you know, historically we have been such a large organization. I mean, we are, you know, 90,000 employees associates strong and growing. And within that, we for decades have been invested in addressing and reducing and eliminating health disparities. But because of kind of just the size of our organization, the genuine enthusiasm of employees and business units within our organization has been kind of a sprinkle here, a sprinkle there, a, a sprinkle there without um, a, a true framework or a system in place that would drive the outcomes that we are as kind of one Elevance Health, we're being one band, one sound. So, so what's happened uh, uh, recently um, over the past couple of years has been that we have established that kind of unified framework. And for us, it's health equity by design. That is our approach because we believe that um, it, you know, health equity won't be achieved by happenstance or chance, but only by intentionally embedding the principles of it in every process, practice, and program that we do. And so we have a framework to kind of guide that. Part of that we've talked about today, because part of that is how we get to know our members better in regards to data and how we use that information. The other is how do, how do we build more meaningful partnerships with providers and enhance their capacity to deliver on health equity while holding them accountable to that? You know, how do we continue to bolster our own internal culture to advance health equity? Having our own shop in order so that as we interact with members, create programs with members that we are doing the best that we can, again, to help them achieve their optimal health. What are we doing in, to ensure that we are continuing to push the envelope for affordability uh, and, and, and access? So these are just some of the things that we are doing intentionally by design. And that goes from the data piece, how we are leveraging um, AI, artificial intelligence responsibly, 
mitigating biases that we identify, trying to prevent them in the first place. Um, but I mean, processes even down to our annual incentive plan for associates and executives, you know, embedding metrics in that incentive plan that again, hold us accountable to delivering on advancing health equity. So, you know, we learned, we've kind of come from an area where, yeah, it's good. People have enthusiasm um, and we see differences and we see point solutions, different point solutions, depending on what business unit you're in. Um, but now I feel like we have a very unified framework um, that is allowing us to start to really make some meaningful headway in impacting not only our members, but the communities in which they reside. Yeah, and that's a great point. We can't get this done on our own. We need partnerships, number one. But number two, there's about a billion point solutions and an app for everybody part and in a lot of different ways to evaluate that. Um, so, Dr. Dennis, do you have any recommendations on rigor and evaluating who to partner with um, whenever you're looking at some of this stuff? So I think that that you know looking at partnerships and, and looking at sort of how how to approach at scale making change it's really important that we look at experience and that that again we try to avoid um, superficiality and we try to try to avoid making it like this program is for you know. Um, equity in this particular tiny domain. This program is for equity in this particular tiny domain. And that we're actually looking at broader longitudinal strategy and that we're looking at incentivizing meaningful change. And we know that in healthcare, um, we know how to incentivize people to change their behaviors. We've been doing it for a very long time. Um, you know, I look at quality models. I look at models that that really tie compensation thoughtfully to um, to reaching specific quality goals. Well, we know that there is no quality without equity. So we cannot ha say that any entity met a quality goal if there is dramatic disparity between socio-demographic groups. Um, so we have two minutes left. Uh, in the last two minutes, what is there something that you didn't get across or one takeaway you want our listeners to kind of go back and do or, or start to think about? Um, so Benjamin, do you want to start us? All right, put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think this is an amazing discussion. Um, the thing that I, I think a lot about and we need to do more of, and I, I'm just talking about as a, a t and and as an employer, but I think maybe all employers need to think about this. I've actually talked to some peers about it and I've asked them like, what is your connectivity point from benefits to the DE&I team? Um, and ours is a, a series of relationships that are growing, but they need to be stronger. And I think like when we show up together um, and we, we kind of tell the story, not only of ways that we want to affect communities of internal employees, but external external uh, communities, you know, outside of the at t walls, and we can leverage our resources to do that. And we we start to get better at like measuring the benefit of those things in partnership with the mm -hmm. DE and I team. Like, I think this gets lots of traction. I think it's the thing that stays top of mind with our most senior executives and we could really make an impact on. And so I, I think for the employers out there, how are you partnering with your DE and I peers? Um, I've been thinking a lot about this and I'm going to spend more time doing it. And I think the stronger those bonds, the better. That's a great point. Uh, Dr. Dennis, in 30 seconds, anything you want anyone to take away, like the one thing they can yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say using this uh, old disability rights quote, nothing about us without us. So strategy should include impacted communities, be it focus groups or otherwise, and ongoing intervention should include governance that's actually coming from stakeholders who are from the communities that you're trying to impact. Shared experience is so important. Dr. Gray? Yeah, in the 10 seconds, I'll just say, you know, to complement what uh, Nora was saying, you know, in the event that you don't have a direct community representative in your meeting, you be that voice. Um, bring that question into the room about who is not at the table, um, what voice is not being represented in the program that you are designing, if, if you're designing a program uh, within your business, um, and who could be um, uh, adversely impacted by your good intention and why. You know, as you think about those with limited English proficiency, those living with a disability, those who live in a rural area, 
think about those communities uh, when you are designing programs, when you are thinking about, you know, you have a good intention, but who could be adversely affected? So with that, I just want to thank my amazing panelists for getting deep into the weeds, this very difficult conversation and really providing people with, uh, you know, equity and action, things that they can actually walk away with. Um, so we'll wrap up this panel and move on to the next.